Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session of our webinar series on assessment, pass or fail assessing assessment. Uh, this is the first of four pre-recorded sessions that we will be publishing throughout the summer of 2021. And I'm very, very excited to be here today with Simon Beal and Sally Thorne. Uh, before I give them the floor, maybe I'll shortly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alice Modena. I'm a professional development coordinator at Euroclio, and uh, I am embarking in this journey to learn more about assessment, of which I know nothing. So it's going to be very easy to teach me something. Um, I know that Sally and Simon have uh, agreed to introduce themselves. So well, my role here has ended. Uh, Simon and Sally, take it away. You want, would you like to introduce so, uh, Hi, I'm Simon Beale. I'm an assistant uh, head teacher at a West London School and also subject leader of history and politics. And I'm Sally Thorne and I'm head of humanities at a secondary school in Bristol. And um, also, I've, yes, also head of history as part of that. Um, and we're talking to you today about online formative assessment um, and particularly hoping to share with you some of the things that we've been doing that have been successful. Um, so when we think about formative assessment and what that is um, in, the, in, in all classrooms, what we're thinking about really is something that is going to allow for us to intervene in the learning journey um, for students. It's a meaningful intervention in the learning process it's really useful feedback for the student, but there's also some feedback in there for the teacher as well um, that allows us as teachers to be able to adjust what we're doing and, and plan on our feet for students. Um, it then therefore that helps us to close the gap between where the students are and where they where we want them to be. Um, and the the most the thing that I think is the best about formative assessment is that it really personalizes your teaching for each student. So if we think about differentiation, assessment for learning is a really good way, formative assessment, a really good way to close that gap, make sure that you are differentiating for each student. So it then becomes something that is just in time, it is feedback you give them just in time uh, um, for it to be meaningful and it is just for them. It's an individualized and personalized um, comment. And I, I, I'm a big fan of a meme and I like this, uh, this one in particular. Um, as you can see here, you've got your students and they focus very, very hard on the grade. That's all they're really interested in. Um, but they're not uh, really realizing that behind that there's good knowledge and there's analytical thinking and evaluation, lots of other things that you would uh, that, that go into making that grade. And formative assessment is about pinning down those individual skills and moving them on um, so that that overall picture then becomes um, that overall grade goes up. OK, so as we were planning this session, we uh, had some time to kind of reflect on what teaching in a pandemic was like. Now, obviously, we're in a UK context, but all schools in all over Europe have had to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and, and providing education for our students. And the four key areas we kind of found were the issues involved in teaching a pandemic was having to change in an instant. So that time in March, uh, where for one reason or another, we, we all had different journeys in going into a lockdown, but we all then had to essentially switch to an online environment when lots of us didn't have the skill set to be able to deliver. We then developed technological issues from our own you know, personal circumstances, our technological circumstances. A big part of that was actually what access to technology we had and the access to a good internet connection that we had and our students as well all the way from ages 11 up to 18, they had very different circumstances. A feeling of playing catch up that you were able to see, the more engaged you were, you know, with things like Euroclio, but also Twitter and all of the online social media, that you were aware that there were lots of other things happening out there that you were playing catch up with. You know, were you a Google school, were you a Microsoft school, or actually did you use neither of those and you actually were trying to play catch up on everything. And then, probably more like in either the second lockdown or the third, you might have felt a bit overwhelmed with the wealth of options that are out there. Suddenly being bombarded 
with all these really amazing technological ways to teach, but actually not having the time to train yourself in them or actually just feeling that kind of overwhelmed. So Sally, what would you say were your kind of big reflections of the rewards and challenges over the last 18 months? Um, I think you know, I, I, I like learning myself and that's something that I really enjoy. And it was nice to be able to upskill myself, to be able to, to kind of do that in a, a you know, to, to teach in a different way really. So I remember like right at the very, very beginning um, of the pandemic, before we were, we were even sent home, I had a student who was unwell and um, was isolating at home. Um, and I dialed her in, which I jumped the gun on the safeguarding. Um, but, <laughs> mm. but she was year 13. It, you know, it seemed to be really important. So she was able to join into the lesson using um, you know, the technology that we had available to us. But just for that to just become normal um, has been great. We have students that, you know, for whatever reason, they can't come to school. Um, I think it's, it's great to, to have that, to just see that having seamlessly appeared um, has been great. But I think what I found the biggest challenge is, is just then feeling like I, I never really get away from it because it, like online teaching feels like it's a much bigger job um you know my school cut our, our lessons by 15 minutes when we started teaching live so they were only 45 minutes instead of an hour and that was a real game changer because it just is really hard work <laughs> and I thought teaching in front of a class was really hard work but this is yeah it's just something else so I guess work-life balance how about you yeah, I, I definitely echo that as one of the things. I think, I, I think the biggest reward has been the ability to get more from some of the students that in a classroom environment don't contribute as much. That's been probably the best thing of using different technological techniques for, from a pedagogical perspective to be able to get responses from a whole class, where sometimes actually I thought that even if I was thinking I was using assessment for learning, there were still pupils able to hide. I was much more able to assess a wider variety of people. But I think the same thing, you know, that, that actually the biggest challenge has been the breaking down of the barriers between when school time was and when home time was. You know, pupils were actually were working at very strange and different hours. Therefore, they were contacting you at different hours. I mean, even sometimes your school was contacting you at different hours. So I think you're right. That breakup of what actually was home learning and work learning and all those kinds of things all combined into one yes and I, you know I, I spent a lot of time sitting at this desk and I've got my home computer which wasn't quite up to speed for for managing teams so I've got my home computer here I've, I'm really lucky I've got two screens this one that I'm looking at and this one they're looking at and then I have my laptop in front of here as well I kept using the wrong mouse and it I, it just there's but there's what else can you do I have to be I have to be at this desk um, but then in the evenings, I have to be at this desk if I'm doing other things as well. So it was really difficult to get away from that. Absolutely. Um, OK, so we um, we what Simon and I did was you came up with this list of um, some common methods of formative assessment, particularly in history. Uh, there's like a heavy um, emphasis on knowledge learning and, and re retaining the facts like and, and that's something that I think that we assess quite regularly in class so there's quite a lot of things on here that are targeted at that um uh that that kind of history learning so short answer quizzes multiple choice quizzes um questions general questioning um and, and you know also i i think that the formative assessment that we do in the lesson i don't know about you simon but i think the most powerful one for me is this like having these one-to-one -one conversations with mm. students um, and just kind of being able to look at the class and you, you know, is everybody like, or is everybody like, mm, you know, just being able to see their faces is really, really important as well when you're particularly when you're explaining a new concept. Absolutely. I think nonverbal cues from a class are one of the most important me uh, methods of formative assessment. It's not really talked about very much because it's not, you know, it's not very jazzy and there's not a, a key resource attached to it but actually looking around your class and feeding and getting that instant nonverbal behavioral feedback is really important for this process. And obviously teaching remotely has made that very challenging. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know about, but I know um, 
perhaps we should say how we did how we approached online teaching now this might be a good time to do it so I know that we uh, both our schools did different things didn't we so with my school in the last um lockdown so this the one that's happened um in January from January 2021 um we were teaching all lessons live all day um so each student had a 45 minute online lesson that you were teaching them when they would have been online but there wasn't any expectation that they would have their cameras on um, there wasn't any expectation that they would use their mics. Some teachers were very good at um, encouraging them to do that. I was not one of those teachers. I didn't. I didn't actually have my camera on most of the time either because I, you know, I didn't want them to feel uncomfortable. But um, that made my my kind of classroom atmosphere very different. Oh, and and we were using Teams, so we used Teams for our um, for our software. Yeah, and uh, as a juxtaposition, we're a Google school, so everything we did was through Google. We'd already been doing that, actually, um, for, for a number of years. But we used Google Meets. We actually had a rule um, that you only had to do live content one lesson out of a two-week cycle. So that was one in three or one in five lessons on, on average that had to be live. And even then, it didn't have to be the whole lesson. It was just as a way of checking in. It was more like we, we developed a, a system where if it was the best way of teaching, then that's what you should do. But it shouldn't be doing it for, for the sake of it. Because I think I'm sure Sally and I have heard stories of schools where it was cameras off, mics off all day. And uh, just teachers staring into the void, not really knowing which pupils were engaging and which pupils were actually on their Xbox and just had the laptop open next to them. So, um, yeah, very different approaches that are available. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's it's been helpful to both of us, I think, hasn't it, to do this session together because we've both done some quite different things um, in these contexts. So um, when we were putting it together, I, I went back to this model, um, the, the, the SAMR model, it's SAMR model, that, um, you, you know, about 10 years ago when ed te educational technology was really popular, it was a real buzzy thing. Um, I think this model kind of developed at that time. And um, the idea really is to think about um, how you're using technology um, to uh, kind of, I don't know, to alongside the pedagogy that you're already doing, if you like. So the, the SAMA model suggests there are four parts um, to using technology. So as you can see in this um, cartoon of it, you've got this man on the edge of the shore wondering what's in the ocean. And what we've got here are four different um, kind of ways of, of, of doing that. So substitution, where tech is just um, a, a direct substitute for the tool, and there's not really any functional change. Um, augmentation, uh, where tech acts as a, as a substitute, but it actually makes the task a bit better. And then modification, where technology is um, allowing for significant task redesign and, and new things. Um, and then finally, redefinition, um, which allows for the creation of, of kind of new tasks that were previously inconceivable. So things that we were able to do in the online environment that we really would have struggled to do in lessons. And I, um, over the weekend, I had a chat with my old friend, Mark Anderson. If you um, you may have come across him on Twitter, he's ICT evangelist. Um, so, at, you know, he loves a bit, a bit of technology in the classroom and he was, went to great pains to, to remind me that it's not a ladder. This isn't a, you know, it, it's not a stage. This is, it's better. Each stage is better than the last one. And that actually the, the technology that you use in the classroom is, is only as good as the person using it. Um, so the technology that is best for your formative assessment in the classroom is one that you are confident using and one that you will use um, as opposed to thinking right it's all about redefining it's all about coming up with that innovation you know we we were in a we are in a global pandemic nobody needs to be innovating at this, <laughs> at this mm. point like we, we just need to get get through um, and and try to make it as good as it could be um, and I know you've got some examples for us here haven't you Simon on the next one. yeah so we put this into a school context Substitution will be stu that students are answering questions about the constitution using a Google Doc instead of filling out a worksheet. So they're using technology to do the task and there's no real difference between the actual task completion. Augmentation will be students accessing an online exhibition with links to more information about the context of the artists and their style. So there you can see that actually it's in enhanced what is already the, the task that was happening anyway. 
Modification would, would be where pupils are carrying out an online debate in which they can react to each other's views and comment on them. And that's the modification into the task because actually that can't happen in a real debate where you have to have any one person at any one time speaking. This would allow for multiple perspectives to be heard and responded to at the same time. And then re redefinition is where students are working in a real time on a project while being able to offer feedback that can be instantly acted upon. And that would obviously, as you say, that's completely redefined how you are operating on that task because you've been able to integrate technology into it. Yeah. And that's how we're gonna kind of address how we apply uh, assessment for learning techniques for formative assessment. Yes, yeah. So what we've done is we've come up with some examples that we've been using um, and we're just under, that we've kind of put under each, each label. But we also had this conversation, didn't we, um, where we were talking about how it kind of depends on the student as well, um, mm. you know, where it falls. So although we might have put some things under substitution, you know, they might also be for, be, you know, modifications for, for other students in other contexts. So Yes, absolutely. So, for example, the, the debate uh, task that I'm, I'm putting here as um, modification, for some pupils that will never respond in a verbal debate, being able to do it online is a complete redefinition for them because actually you'll get more than you would ever dreamed of in a different context. So that is the, de is the definition there of redefinition. And that was yes. a terrible way of explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think that's great, isn't it? Because th this is, it's, a, it's a, whole new, it, like a whole new arena for them um, and, and something that, um, what, would, what would you say, a silver lining is yes. that, that for some students this is it's actually been a um a better yeah a better thing okay so um if i um i'll talk through some of my ideas here then um for substitution and then um simon can tell us about his so mm -hmm. um a couple of the things that i used the most um was that I used the chat function very heavily and our students, my students were, were good chatters. They liked to type. They didn't like putting their mics on, but they really liked to respond um, to things in the chat. So uh, something that I, you know, obviously you can ask a question and students can respond in the chat. Um, but this is um, what I, I tried to do with this was to ask them to type a response, but wait to press enter. Um, and then I would give them a sign and they would all press enter um, on the sign so that all of their answers would come up at the same time. And that kind of gave me the opportunity to do a bit more um, kind of targeting, see who wasn't answering, who wasn't responding in the chat, any wrong answers. It didn't mean I was just getting the answers from the, the fastest typists. Um, I've, I observed a, um, a teacher in my department who did this with duck gifts. So she'd say, uh, when you see the ducks in the chat, that's when you press enter and then she'd give them a minute and then she'd put a duck gif in and that the ducks would like waddle across the chat and they'd all press enter at the same time it's just a, a nice little um a little way of doing that um i also something um i also did was using reactions so um in teams when you're in the chat you can kind of like a post or um put a little heart on it and there's various things that you can do so I would um, put statements in the chat for true or false where students had to put one emoji if they agreed and a different emoji if they disagreed or if they thought it was false. Or I might put three statements in the chat about a historical topic we've been looking at and they had to re respond to the one that they thought was most accurate or most reflective um, of what I'd been teaching them. Um, so those were just two really simple things um, that, I, yeah, that I did. Yeah, and I think it's really important to remember that at the substitution level, you're using technology to replace your normal classroom practice. And the ones I'm going for here are really visual ones, because we talked about the idea earlier about actually it can be easy to feel like those visual cues and stuff will, are gone from your online classroom. But actually, as long as, I mean, it's got to rely on the, on the cameras being on. Get, make sure that the cameras are on and then those kinds of things are, are there for you. So hands up, you know, the, the kinds of things that, Nonverbal is the key because I think a big barrier was not necessarily cameras, but it was unmuting themselves and, and responding that way. So just saying to, to a certain question, right? Everyone with me on this, hands up, seeing, reading the room um, as one. Changing their screen name is another really good nonverbal way of pupils communicating. So for example, it's very easy to just think about it and then quickly 
change their screen name uh. <laughs> to be able to uh, give you some feedback in that way. Um, and it can, it can be an answer to a question. It can be anything you want it to be that you can get every single pupil uh, responding almost instantaneously without actually a need for le leaving the presentation, leaving the software to be able to answer something else. And the same thing, a thumbs up, thumbs down on the lesson. Where are we in our learning? Very quick, easy to do, but it's only a substitution. It's not you know, harnessing anything, but it does provide you that with that instant formative feedback. Yes, yeah, oh, I like that. Yeah, that's a, a nice trick about changing the name. We, had, we did a bit of changing the background. My, um, uh, the, well, I had a, a PGCE student with me who taught me that if you cover the camera in Teams, you can cover up the camera, um, but switch your camera on. And if you've got a background picture, then you can that all, all you can see then is that background picture. So it's a way of of, of like uploading a picture or sharing some work um, without actually having to show your face. And uh, that was certainly something that was was a popular, um, yeah, a popular tool that I taught them to use. And they were able to then share pictures of their work, which was quite nice. Absolutely love that. Um, yeah, I, I, when I first introduced it to my uh, 14 and my class of 14 and 15 year olds, they, um, I had one beautiful pastoral scene like mountains and a river. And then I had a meme of a man with a burger for, the, for his head. <laughs> it's like you've got the two ends of the spectrum here. I'm glad that, that you know, everybody's everybody feels represented. Um, OK, so uh, we'll move on then to think about augmentation. Um, I don't know about you, but I use a lot of Microsoft Forms for quizzes and feedback really all the way through. And my um, knowledge of, of that, of using those got a lot better um, to the point where, you know, they are still now part of my practice. And we're going to mm. talk about that at the end, what we're going to keep. But just, you know, short short quizzes um, through forms, self-marking quizzes, they were really, really helpful. Um, little things, one or two question um, quest quizzes that um, you can just get really quick feedback from students on. Um, that was something that I used really pretty much every lesson. Um, and the same with respond, but wait, and I talked about that in the first one where they wait to put, uh, wait to type their answer into the chat to press enter. And that's a good way of kind of, I think a bit, a bit like mini whiteboards that you might use those in the classroom. Um, I also did a bit of taking the temperature. So thinking about how, um, uh, you know, not, be, not really being able to see their faces. I made use of, of quite a lot of um, images like this that you can see on this slide. So which medieval frog are you today? Um, and they'd have to say in the chat which one they felt like. Um, and that would give me an idea about who was feeling um, like they were being vomited out of somebody's mouth and who was feeling, you know, pretty cute like this one, definitely. Um, and they quite like that. It's a nice way of getting a bit more history in. We then, you know, are able, this opens a conversation up about where these pictures come from, which is yeah, quite absolutely. nice. Um, and we got, a yeah, so I had a, a, a big range of those and I found them really helpful um, just for kind of getting involved, getting the students a bit more involved. Um, and I also, as I got a bit more confident, I started to use breakout rooms a little bit more. Um, and something that I um, found was helpful is quite often my live lessons would begin with um, maybe 50, particularly for older students, maybe 15 minutes of me teaching them and then they would go away and do their task for 30 minutes and submit it to me at the end. Um, but I started to, what I, so what I do is I say, you can either stay in the meeting or you can leave if you're feeling confident. But I started instead to use breakout rooms. So I would have a breakout room for, that I had named, I would like some help. And they would join that breakout room if they needed something. And I was then able to go in there with them. Um, and I kind of have that one to one and and then also record those sessions as well. So when I was doing feedback with my uh, 15 and 16 year olds on their exam practice, I was able to have a, a one to one with them in a meeting that, that I could then record. So it's the same sort of one to one that I would have um, with any struggling student if we were in person, but was actually better, better augmented by the fact that that recording then existed that they could download and they could go back and listen to it again. 
um, as opposed to having to kind of make sure that they try to remember it all or write it all down. So I thought, yeah, that those were those were really helpful things to learn as I progressed in my online teaching. Yeah, and then in terms of augmentation, I found polls. Obviously, they exist within Microsoft Teams and Google Meets uh, within the, the software itself. Being able to do very quick online polls, you could do it for, as, as Sally said, the kind of taking the temperature ones of how pupils are feeling about a current part of the lesson. But it could also be used for more knowledge-based um, assessment for learning where you're, you're working out where pupils are in their understanding by asking quick questions as you're going through the course. Um, Socrative is another really good piece of retrieval practice. It's an online uh, multiple choice quiz in which you are in control of the questions and the multiple choices that you have. And I was telling Sally about this um, yesterday that what you can do is be really clever with the actual multiple choices so that each wrong answer isn't just a wrong answer that's a silly answer that you've used to make four, but actually they all are trying to diagnose a specific misconception or misunderstanding based on the topic the question is about. So that it then informs you afterwards because you're then given how the whole class has uh, performed and how each individual student has performed. They'll know it's wrong uh, based on just a yes or no answer, but actually you'll know which answer they've selected. So it really helps you in your forward planning to know where the misconceptions are in your class. And another one, a, a slightly more, uh, it's a bit like actually, and um, Sally's used to the frogs there, in that Flipgrid is essentially uh, an online program that allows all students to reply to a question with a video. They can record a very quick video, which I suppose in a TikTok generation, they're quite keen on doing. So they can all respond in that short video format, and then you can watch them all to understand uh, where they are. So that kind of covers augmentation, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it just... It was nice to be able to try these new tools out really and to find that it, you know you're not printing reams and reams of paper quizzes that you then have to take in and mark mm. that these things actually it is it's a better way of doing it um so moving on then to uh, modification um so i i've got my my um top two tools here um that i that i enjoyed the most and i know whiteboard you did you, did you say jamboard is like is jamboard is i think is the google equivalent of whiteboard yes okay so whiteboard if I, I think it's yeah it is it's just a really useful way of allowing students to respond to something so it's like using mini whiteboards our students all have mini whiteboards um in school so that there's kind of they're, they're just expected to have them out um, every lesson. So we, we use them a lot. Um, and I think it's actually better um, using them online because they can't see what each other is doing. So, so they can't look at each other's answers, which is good. Um, and, you know, I can the, the other thing that I really liked about it that makes it even better than having physical whiteboards is that I can set up something for them on a um, on whiteboard.fi and I can push that to all of their screens. So I did this with, um, I had them do a, a kind of change over time diagram um, about Elizabethan England. And I was, I kind of therefore set up a basic uh, graph with the different uh, elements on it that I wanted them to put on. And they were then able to move that around and decorate it the way that they wanted to. So you're then taking out that um, the time that they would spend creating the the format of it, if you like, and they're just focusing on that history on on kind of arranging those those in the way that they want them to. Um, and also, what I loved about this was that I could then just screenshot the whole screen of all of their individual whiteboards and paste that into the chat so that they could see what each other had done, or I could spotlight individual boards. It's just a really really good tool. Um, and then the other one I liked was uh, was Mentimeter, which I think is, is this that like virtual exit to, or is it like Pear Deck that you were talking about? I think it'll, I think it's probably like Pear Deck. It's like Pear Deck. Um, so Mentimeter, just a really simple um, online presentation software that you can embed polls into. But the thing I the, the one that I liked the most about Mentimeter is that you can create a word cloud. So if you say mm. To, right okay it's we, it's the end of the lesson I really need to see what you've learned so I want you to type your top three words from this lesson um into this uh into this poll 
and then a word cloud is then is then created of their of their best words and sometimes if it was a class that I felt were not particularly on board one of those words would have to be their name so that I could see every, check that everybody's name was on that word cloud um, and that was just a really helpful way of seeing what they would picked up from it um, and the, the, I also found that really useful for you know in, in history we do a lot of ordering don't we like most important cause mm. lessons so um, there is a poll that you can put on there where you can choose where they have to all rank order things. Um, and that was a useful, a useful aspect of it as well. Yeah. And I think what we're finding here is that actually we're just different. There are just different programs. And, and when you might feel overwhelmed about things, you just realize that actually quite a few of these are doing the same thing, just in slightly different ways. And it's just about choosing one and going with it. Mm. So um, one of the big, biggest things I've found in terms of modifying a lot of activities is using Google Docs to complete the activity. Because Google Docs can be shared across multiple people operating at the same time, it massively increases the functionality of a lot of the activities you would like to do uh, in a classroom. But now also you can see what everyone's doing because it shows everyone that's operating on it. You can track all the different contributions. So it means that things like group work, you can still set in an online environment in the online classroom, but you can see what every person is doing within it. And if you set it up, you could see what every people was doing. We ended up actually having online exercise books. So all, all activities were set and they had these online exercise books, which all it was was a Google Doc, but it was the one they kept going back to. And you could set a task. And then during your hour lesson that you were doing online in uh, live content, but it wasn't actually uh, online uh, as in, in a Google Meet, you could spend the whole time just going around modifying, leaving comments. It was like live marking where you could get around everyone without having to leave your desk. Really, really useful. Um, yeah, as um, Sally was saying, Jamboard is the Google version of uh, Whiteboard. It, again, it allows for everyone to operate on the same board. So it's a lot like Google Docs in that way. So you can put things in. It doesn't work quite as well, actually, when you send it out to everyone. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, save itself in a very convenient way, actually. Virtual exit ticket is the same. You could have it that one Google Doc is set up to um, have that, or all pupils have to reply to your Google Classroom um, task with just a small comment as the exit ticket. But as Sally said, uh, time and time again, what you realize is all this information is held. We were discussing yesterday the amount of interviews where I've been in, where it's ended with exit tickets. And the interviewee will then tell you about looking at the exit tickets, what it's told them. But where does that then go? That's the thing. It's, it's on pieces of paper that usually are then going to be discarded. Whereas doing it in the virtual way like this, there's a digital uh, paper trail of all this that you yeah. can then refer back to. And Pear Deck is the same thing as Mentimeter in that it offers you an opportunity to input your Google Slides or PowerPoint into Pear Deck and then layer some uh, quizzes within the presentation as you go through it, which pupils can click on as they're doing and it gives you that live feedback yeah just some of these tools are just i i think they're amazing as actually i think about i think the same about zoom that makes me because zoom was such a small thing and then the pandemic hit and now everybody uses like zoom is just this huge thing and i think the people the creators of these things like jamboard and mentimeter and that must have seen this massive spike <laughs> and i wonder now whether it's kind of ooh, coming back yeah, absolutely back the other the other way but it's just, yeah, the, the, it's been great to, to be able to see some of these tools and to make use of them. Um, I'm going to let you make a start with the uh, redefinition one, because certainly, as, as I'll explain, this is one I struggled with more. But would you like to talk us through what you did? Sure. Yeah. So um, we found through Google Classroom, uh, one of the features when people submit work, there is a plagiarism checker. Now, if you have the normal version or the free version, I suppose, of Google Classroom, you're limited to three times per class to use that. But if you have the uh, enterprise version, the upgraded version, you can use it as many times as you want. So my 18 year olds at the end of their course have to do a piece of coursework and it's 4,500 words. It's supposed to be all their own work with proper citations and referencing. If they submit it in Google Classroom, it runs a plagiarism checker and I get that instant feedback of how much is their own work? Has it been just done accidentally and that they haven't referenced prob probably, or is it they have actually acted dishonestly? And I can find that out instantly. Whereas normally I'd have to be reading through it, judging their kind of the syntax 
and all those kinds of other signs of of uh, dishonesty. And it does that instantly. So that's a big redefinition of the uh, submission of coursework. Mm, I'm that. a big believer as well in, in this idea that actually part of good uh, formative feedback and assessment for learning is getting that feedback as quickly as possible to the students. And a big part of the redefinition for me is the ability to provide live, live feedback through using Google, through using these um, online quizzes and things like that. It's the ability to provide feedback so instantly to the student either through the program doing the work for me or me being able to see so many more students in a lesson than I would normally. And then connected to that is a program called MOTE, M-O-T-E. And it allows you to provide verbal audio feedback to written tasks within Google, or uh, I think it allows it to, you can input into Microsoft as well. It meant that students were hearing my voice feeding back to them, even though they completed the activity a while ago, and then I'd done the night before the feedback. What's even better about Moat is it allows you to make an, a ver an audio bank of responses. So when you can read, when you're marking, you can actually just input the recorded Moat pieces of feedback, which are the same maybe for groups of students. So you don't have to record again and again and again the same thing. So it does save you time, but it actually allows you to, to put the time in and create a really rich and detailed set of uh, audio responses to then provide feedback. So those are the things that really redefined really it for me. Yeah, I and and, and I was I was uh, motivated, I guess, when when we had this conversation before we did this recording because I originally I spent a long time thinking about what I'd redefined in, in my assessment that for learning with um, with technology and and I really couldn't come up with anything. I you know I I found that the the daily grind of, of transferring everything into an online lesson was so much that it, it just it became too big to try and think about or well, how can I do something completely new and also thinking well but we don't know when this is you know hopefully I'm never going to go back to a point where I'm teaching online all the time yeah. again so then the, then it has a limited shelf life but I I did also use a, a bit of recording feedback so I tried a little bit with um to use uh, OneNote in Microsoft Teams and I have a colleague who teaches Spanish um, at where I work, and he absolutely loves OneNote. He's like lobbying for the languages department to throw away their exercise books and only use OneNote going forward. He's, he's like a one man crusade. I don't think they're going to do it. But, <laughs> um, and that I loved because you can see everything that the students are writing. Again, you can push stuff out to them. And I did, I did record some feedback for them on there, um, which is, is, yeah, is something I tried. But I, yeah, it, it was kind of limited. I found that it, it's still quite, as with so many things, when they're quite new, it was still quite slow. It just, it, yes. you know, it, it didn't necessarily come naturally. So maybe that's one for the next pandemic. Um, <laughs> well, let's, like, let's hope that time never comes. <laughs> um, okay. And do you want to talk, because I know that you, you put this together for your own department, didn't you? To think yes, at my school. So we had a, our inset day last Friday where the whole school came together, uh, but socially distanced, of course, uh, to talk about what we were going to keep from the pandemic. Because I think it's important that while Sally's absolutely right, we're talking about all this stuff being very useful. But there's a, there's a time where you've got to make a decision of what's actually going to be worth keeping and continuing with rather than just it's only useful online, what we're gonna actually integrate. And this is where this kind of matrix comes in handy. So substitution and redefinition are things that have high strategic importance. That means that actually for the way that you teach and how they learn, it really does have an impact and it will be important. But there are other things that are redefin redefinition and modification are just have mod operational importance. That means that it's a different way of doing things and it might be just a bit of a better way of doing things, but it doesn't really help them learn any better. And of course, there are those things that you just want to eliminate. You, you never want to do those things again. And actually maybe they weren't very useful even when you did them. For example, hour long Google Meets or Teams sessions with cameras off and things like that. We never ever want to do them again. No. But there are some things you might say actually they are a substitution. They're a new way of doing something that can be used alongside normal school processes. There are other things that might modify. 
and there are a better way of doing something that will replace the way you normally do it. And the holy grail, the golden nugget, redefinition is a transformation of the way something is done in history and we're gonna, get, we're gonna keep doing it. Even though we're back in the classroom, we're going to keep doing it. And uh, Sally and I have had, our, had a think about these kinds of things about what we will keep going forward. Yeah, and I'm, I'm certainly keeping my increased use of forms. Now that I've learned how to do that, I've learned how to make a form to share it with my department so they can save their own copies um, and, and setting up the self-marking for that, understanding that how that self-marking works a bit more. I have certainly been using those heavily for homeworks since students came back in. Um, and I've also found that it's really helpful for targeting very specific bits of um, history. So my um, 16 year old students, for example, struggling with um, a particular question type on the exam uh, to do with sources and just so uh, setting them source after source where all they're doing is applying their contextual knowledge because that was what they were struggling with as a class and being able to kind of use that as a form without again having to do loads of photocopying was really good and I'm also keeping the taking the temperature means because I really like those and I think there's you know it, it's another opportunity for me to just cram even more sources into my lesson just mm -hmm. so that students are familiar with looking at pictures from the past and thinking about what those pictures symbolize and, and kind of what they mean. So those are definitely staying. Also, I really love frogs. So I have to keep those in mind. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm gonna move that one over to my side of the column as well, actually, this, <laughs> those temperature memes. Um, for me, it's gonna be this Google Classroom coursework. It has been transformational in the way I've been able to mark and give feedback. So everything like that's gonna happen online next year. Um, regardless of where we're operating. And then the same with Socrative questioning, using those multiple choice questions online as homeworks to be able to really gauge how pupils have understood the learning so that I, it can inform my short, medium and long-term planning. Again, it's really redefined the way I've thought about how I ask questions and how they are recorded so that I can use them later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think those, those definitely sound like that sound like they've been um, they've redefined things for you um, in history. It just made you think about and these things also like writing those quizzes has really made me think about yeah about breaking it down. What do I am I assessing what I really want to to assess? And yeah. and I think both of those things are, are helpful for doing that. Okay, um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. It's been really nice to talk to you about this. It has it's been wonderful. I've really enjoyed thinking, like reflecting on my practice over the past year. Um, and we hope everyone that watches this video does too. Yes, <laughs> you found lots of useful ideas. Thank you so so much, uh, Simon and Sally, for for sharing, you know, all your internal reflections and all this useful and interesting advice with us. I'm I'm glad we're recording this video a couple of weeks before it's published so I can find all the links and all <laughs> the how to's and the, you know, useful readings to add and create a very nice package that we can use to start our webinar series. Thank you for everyone who watched the video and we'll watch the video. Uh, the next video coming out will actually, yeah, uh, continue our conversation about formative assessment. We're gonna be talking about how to use formative assessment during the lesson to change the course of the lesson, both online and also face-to-face, -face, where we hope we can go back to the face-to-face. -face. So we're gonna bring some of the face-to-face -to, -face to the lesson. And yeah, thank you so, so much. And oh. see you soon. Yes, thank you. Thank Absolutely. you for inviting me. It's been really fun, really fun to chat.